Hello, welcome to Free Bible Commentary with Pastor Teacher Dr. Bob Utley. Be sure to visit Free Bible Commentary at www.freebiblecommentary.org. Now, here's Bob. Jeremiah chapter 6. This is the seventh in a series of poems that deal with the invader from the north. Now, the invader from the north is a common biblical metaphor because of the geographical location of the nation of Israel. There's no way to, to evade, invade the nation of Israel except from the north and the south. And the only one down south that's ever done that has been um, Egypt. And so every other major world power that has hassled the Hebrew people has come from a northern route because of the major desert areas with no water that border the nation of Israel. So whether it is the uh, Babylonians or the um, Assyrians or whatever other uh, Hittite, whatever other people have come down as far as military invasion have come from the north. And that is what the, the allusion to here is in Jeremiah chapter 6. Now, if we knew exactly the date of these particular poems, we could pretty well lock into a historical setting. But the book of Jeremiah is chronologically disrupted terribly. He lived over a long period of kings and situations, and the book of Jeremiah does not follow as we would write a book in chronological order. It does follow a topical order or a order around certain themes. And I just am not sure, and I rather just not have to assign it to a certain part of Jeremiah's life when these different poems uh, came into being. What I want to do to you, and to you, for you, with you, <laughs> maybe after we get through this long chapter, it'll be doing it to you, but uh, we are getting somewhat repetitious as far as the content of poems. They're... They are pretty much similar. Israel sinned. She won't repent. God's going to get her. I'll give you one more chance to repent. If you don't, I'm going to hit you with a hammer. Now, that's been, <laughs> that's been the content of these last few chapters, and we're still into that. So when these chapters get repetitive, the main thing that we're going to pick up on is words, phrases, relationships, Old Testament theology. And what I'm going to try to do to you is to open your mind Old Testament to Old Testament ways of thinking. Uh, we're very guilty, all of us, in reading the Bible with the glasses of 20th century Western-oriented American individualism. And that cannot interpret a first century Oriental corporate um, understanding. So we have to get back to the time of its day. We have to look at context. And that's what I hope we can do tonight. Well, let's begin in verse 1 then. I hope you'll follow me in your printed outline. Um, Flee for safety, O sons of Benjamin, from the midst of Jerusalem. Now, that may seem not a startling statement to you, but that really is for several reasons. Number one, Jeremiah is not saying repent and God will spare you. Jeremiah is saying destruction is coming. It's inevitable. It's here. And he's also saying, in the ancient times, I think a probably good example of this historically, is the destruction of Jerusalem by Titus in A.D. 70, which is, of course, hundreds of years down the line from even this. But when the Roman armies came into Palestine, the people around the major walled cities went into the cities. And so it caused overcrowding, lack of supplies, the water ran out, it caused all kind of diseases from overpopulation, uh, and it was no help because the Romans knocked the walls down and seized the cities and however it had to last, they did. Usually the place to go when trouble came was into a walled city. That's what they were built for. But Jeremiah says, don't go to the city. He's going to say, flee to the south, to the Judean wilderness. That's your only hope, flee. Now, the mention of these two towns in verse 1, both of them are to the south of Jerusalem, which tells the enemy is coming from the north. The only way to flee would be the southern wilderness areas, okay? Now, when it says, O sons of Benjamin, why would Jeremiah say, O sons of Benjamin? 
That's his tribe. Uh, his city, Anatoth, three miles from Jerusalem, is in the territory of Benjamin. I'll even shock you more. Did you know the city of Jerusalem is in the territory of Benjamin, not in the territory of Judah? Joshua, chapter 15, verse 8. Jerusalem is a Benjamite city geographically, but she is identified with the kingdom of Judah because of the Messiah. Now, when it mentions here, blow the trumpet in Tekoa. Now, the, the Hebrew word for blow and the Hebrew word for Tekoa are exactly the same as far as consonants. It's a play on word sounds. And, uh, but, of course, Tekoa is a southern city, 12 miles from Jerusalem or so, I think, when it says, raise a signal over Beth ha Karim." Now, that means the house of the vineyard. Now, we're not exactly sure where this is. It's, if you see in your reference Bible, it's mentioned once in the book of Nehemiah. That's the only place else it's mentioned. We feel like that it's a, one of the southern cities. And this deal about a fire signal, I put in your outline, see Lackish uh, Ostraca. And <laughs> that's not a Lackish. <laughs> I'm going to skip that. I forgot what the bird's called. Ostrich, ostrich, yes. That's not a bird. This is a piece of broken pottery with writing on it. And so I brought to you tonight a very interesting little book. I want to read this piece of broken pottery that I'm going to be referring to. It was found in 1935 under the city gates, the ruins of the city of Lachish. And uh, this is a book that's very interesting. If you have never uh, read these things and would like to, it's called Documents from the Old Testament. And what it is, it is an English translation of all of the archaeological finds, well, not all of them because they're pretty big, but the major ones, okay, uh, that deal with the interpreting of the Bible, and it's indexed. And so I want to read to you part of, uh, of Ostrakhan number 4 from the city of Lachish, which deals with these fire signals. Now, we didn't know exactly what it meant about a signal. We knew they didn't have flashlights because everybody wasn't in business. But we didn't know if it meant a hand signal or a, some kind of polished mirror signal or uh, the trumpet signal, okay? Because we've already blown the trumpet up here, and that's the zophar, the ram's horn, and so we didn't know if it wasn't another musical kind of thing. Well, we found this uh, piece of broken pottery with ancient writing on it, which helped us to identify the kind of writing in Jeremiah's day. And this is the last sentence. And my Lord, which means Mr. here, will know that we are watching for the signals from Lachish according to all the signs which my Lord hath given, for we cannot see Azekah, which means that there was a fog or it was too far away. What they're saying, this, this is a military letter saying we couldn't see what this city's doing, but we're watching the signals from Lachish to know when the enemy comes. And so it fits historically right into this time of Jeremiah when these northern enemy finally came. We think it's either Babylon or Assyria. It's probably Babylon. And so here we have an uh, outside source helping us understand the Bible better. You might want to get this little book. It's really a neat one. Documents from the Old Testament Times by Winton Thomas. It's Harper Torch Book Series. Now, then it says... The evil looks down from the north and great destruction. There's the allusion to the enemy of the north again. Then verse 2. Now, verse 2 is really a problematical Hebrew passage. Um, who has King James? Phil, you usually carry it, don't you? Will you read verse 2 for me in King James? Ah, that's exactly what New American Standard has. It has a little the phrase different. A comely and dainty one. The daughter of Zion I will cut off. Now that King James and New American Standard are pretty close. Let me read to you uh, the Septuagint, which is the Greek translation. Thy pride, O daughter of Zion, uh, shall be taken away. Thy pride. Let me read the New Jerusalem Bible, which is the new official translation for Roman Catholic Church. Uh, it says, shall... Uh, Shall we compare the daughter of Zion to a tender pasture? Now, if you have Revised Standard Version, that's pretty close, isn't it? Who has RSV here? Anybody? Does it have about a pasture there? Verse 2? The reed? Oh, breed. Okay.
Okay. Uh, anybody else have another translation? Living Bible? or Yeah. Well, that's, that says it, doesn't it? Uh, the reason that there's been such ambiguity over this is that um, this, little, this Hebrew words comely and dainty can mean pasture, same consonants. And, of course, the consonants what believe is inspired. The vowels were not put in by the Masoretic scholars till the 9th century A.D. Now, the consonants for pasture and the consonants for dainty one are the same. And because, why would I want it to be pasture? What in this... Why would I just take that out of your Bible and want pasture instead of dainty one? Why would I want to do that? It fits so much better, the shepherds coming, doesn't it? And, of course, the shepherds are the, false, the foreign kings and the, the, their sheep grazing all the land of Egypt are the, are the soldiers. So I really think pasture, you are a beautiful pasture, but foreign sheep will eat your blades to the ground. That, that's the idea, okay? Your doom is sure, and the metaphor I'm using to describe it is shepherds and sheep. So I think pasture is a much better translation. By the way, it's not daughter of Zion. These two words, in my opinion, used all through Jeremiah, are in apposition. It's daughter dash Zion. It's not daughter of Zion. He's calling Zion daughter. And so they're in apposition, not with of, but daughter dash Zion. The nation of Judah is being spoken of as a daughter, a beloved daughter, the apple of the eye daughter. And yet she's about to be completely ravished and cut off. Now, the shepherds there, you see, they're going to pitch their tents around her. They'll pasture in his place. Uh, it's talk, Hebrew words, the word hand there, but it means his particular dividing. They're going to divide up the city of Jerusalem to foreign people. And they're going to graze it till there's nothing left. That's, that's the metaphor. Now, look at verse 4. Mine has, prepare war against her. Does anybody have something different than that? Anybody? Excuse me? Battle? Okay. The word I'm looking on is prepare for. The Hebrew word there is the... Yes. Yeah, what translation? Berkeley. The Hebrew word is sanctify. Now, how could every translation of this auditorium make prepare for war and the Masoretic text in the Berkeley edition have sanctify? Well, the word is sanctify. So how could they get war out of sanctify? Holy war. This is a conflict in the name of these foreign gods. That's why it's so appalling to Jeremiah that these armies are fighting in a foreign god's name and they're going to take over the children of Israel who are in Yahweh's name. And it seems so incongruous to the prophet. And so what we have here is the idea of holy war. That every battle was done in the name of some god. It was not done for a nation. It was done in a god's name. And so sanctify uh, against her. Notice what's going to happen. This kind of... Uh, 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 this army is so fierce and so set on destroying the people of God. That look what they're going to do. They're going to attack at noon in the heat of the day. Did you watch uh, Masada? Did you watch that show? Remember that the uh, Jewish defender said, it's, uh, have you ever been on the Judean desert in the summertime with no water? <laughs> Man, even grass, even lizards don't get out in the sun, you know. Here's these people, and they're going to fight in the heat of the day. They are so gung-ho. They're going to fight right through the heat of the afternoon. That's not normal for armies in this time, part of the world. Now, are they going to fight in the heat of the noon? Look down there in verse 5. They're going to attack by night. That's highly unusual. Armies were very civilized. They hacked each other to pieces hand-to-hand -hand with swords, but they retired in the evening to eat dinner, get their wounded, and rest till the morning. They could hack each other again. That's civilized war, isn't it? But these turkeys are going against the rules. They're going to have a night attack. Very unusual. Very unusual. They're just not, they just won't waste any time in destroying God's people. Now, a little phrase down here, Woe to us, for the day declines and the shadows of evening lengthen. Have you ever heard of Zophar? It's the book of enlightenment. It's Kabbalah, Jewish mysticism. Uh, just to show you how these groups do this, they would take those little phrases and say, Abraham rules the day and he's mercy. Isaac rules the night and he's judgment. 
So when the night comes, you better be worried because the powers of evil are out. That's a wonderful interpretation. It has just zero to do with the context, doesn't it? Uh, Christian mysticism is no more justified than Jewish mysticism or any other kind of mysticism. The only thing that we're held accountable for is our treatment of the text as we have it. Which means I don't care how good your ideal is or how true your thoughts, if it doesn't come from the text, I think it's invalid. One example. Now it says in verse 5, destroy her palaces. Anybody else have another translation? Remember those beautiful towers built in the wall of Jerusalem? Feel? This is it. Those, they call them fortress towers. It could mean citadels or, or strong places within the city. But what it's saying is, her strongest fortification, we're going to knock it down. We're going to knock it down. Now it says, thus saith the Lord of hosts. There's a little play on words there. Here comes this foreign army. And God's name is mentioned. This is the name of God. That means God, the captain of the armies of heaven. Now, isn't it funny that God, in the midst of a losing campaign, is still called the captain of the armies of heaven, the God of hosts. Okay, and um, it says, Cut down the trees, cast up a siege against Jerusalem. Now, that, uh, that account, that picture, Masada, that showed the building of that ramp and the, the building of that siege tower with the, with the ram's head and all, that was historically accurate going way back hundreds of years to the Babylonians and other groups who used siege tools. They'd build an earthen or wooden or stone ramp halfway up the wall of the city, halfway up. Then they'd get their sling, those big old slingshot things, and push them up that ramp and then throw fire into the city. Okay? That also bring those up those ramps, these big old wooden things with metal ends so they could knock the wall down halfway up where it's not supported by inner buildings, you see. And uh, you say, well, what does this mean about cut our trees down? Trees to a Jewish mind. Now think, of, what are the Jews doing to the desert land in Palestine today? They're reforesting them. The forests are a sign of the blessing of God. Matter of fact, Deuteronomy, if I can find it, chapter 20. Where did I write that down? Oh, Deuteronomy, no. Deuteronomy 20, 19 and 20 says to the Israelis, do not cut the trees down even when you besiege one of these cities. Because the trees were just something special. And here the land is going to be devastated. No more trees. They're going to use them for firewood. They're going to build their machines of war with them. They're going to make ramps with them. Totally devastate the land, okay? Now it says, uh, this is a city to be punished. Uh, Septuagint has, you false city. And so there's a difference of opinion over how to translate this. Uh, in verse 7 it says, as a well keeps its fresh water, so she keeps her wickedness. It says the word cistern. A cistern fed by a natural well. So you can take all the water you want to out, but the level stays constant in a well that's fed with a natural spring. What they're saying is, uh, Jerusalem's wickedness, no matter what the prophet did, no matter how much he preached, no matter how much God tried to deal with him, the level of wickedness stayed the same. That's, what, that's, the, that's the metaphor. Now, by the way, this little verse, verse 7, the rabbis who copied the Old Testament by hand were so concerned in getting everything exact that they would count the number of Hebrew consonants in all the Old Testament. And if their copy was off, they'd burn the copy. In this verse, in the Yod, in the Hebrew word Bayar, is the middle letter of the whole Old Testament. Aren't you impressed? But that's how picky they were with translate. They knew where the middle letter of the whole Old Testament was. It's right here. So um, to show you how important they thought the, the, the word was. Now notice where it says violence and destruction. One commentator, a guy who does the Anchor Bible series, Bright, says that in our day and time, this would mean help, police, violence and destruction. And that's the kind of metaphor it is. Uh, when it says there's sickness and wounds are ever before me, we're going to use that metaphor quite a bit this chapter. 
about it being a sickness and a wound that's lightly healed. We'll catch it later, I think, in uh, another verse, and I've forgotten what verse exactly. Okay, when it says, ever before me, the evil of God's people were before his face. It's face to face. Their wickedness, God's face. It's intimate personal contact. And so that, that's why it became so galling to God. Their wickedness was always before him. He could never get it out of his mind. Now, verse 8, be warned, O Jerusalem. This is a verbal tense that I would retranslate that. Except for yourself, child training, O Israel, or be ready for punishment. But you accept it. You be warned. You be ready. You accept what God's going to bring to you to try to correct you. The last part of the verse Lest I be alienated from you. The word here is torn from you. It's really an allusion to the writ of divorcement in Deuteronomy, 30, Deuteronomy 24, 1 through 4, where it says, Write a bill of divorcement, send your wife away. This, this little phrase, lest I be alienated from you, is an allusion to that kind of divorcement. So what is God saying? I'm about to divorce you. That's the, that's the impact of these words. Okay? Um, then verse 9, Thus says the Lord of hosts, They will thoroughly glean as a vine the remnant of Israel. Pass your hand again like a grape gatherer over the branches. Now, the Old Testament has an unusual uh, understanding about the spiritual remnant that is always uh, spared. You can just go through all the prophets and there's always a believing remnant left. Now, it depends on who is being spoken to in verse 9 of what this means. If God is speaking to the foreign nations who are coming to destroy the land, if he's saying, reap this uh, country like you would a vineyard that you don't miss any grapes, you go back over until you haven't left one grape left, then it's saying that it's going to be so devastating the judgment that there won't even be the faithful remnant yet left, okay? That's, that's one possibility. Reap so thoroughly, nothing left. But it may be an allusion to the fact that as God took northern ten tribes Israel into captivity, he left the faithful remnant, hopefully, which was what? Judah. But now even the faithful remnant is being reaped herself because she did not learn from the partial reaping of the ten tribes going to exile. Or, if God is speaking to Jeremiah, if Jeremiah is the one that God is speaking to, what is he telling Jeremiah to do? He's saying, Jeremiah, you look very thoroughly and see if you can find that one righteous person you've been looking for. Remember, he's been looking for one righteous person, not ten like the city of Sodom. He's just looking for one righteous person. He's been looking at him for two chapters. God's saying, now make careful, careful search, Jeremiah, if he is speaking to Jeremiah. And I don't know which it is, to tell you the truth. I really don't. Now, notice in verse 10 where it says, To whom shall I speak and give warning that they may hear? Jeremiah is a little discouraged. He's saying, look, I preach and I preach and nobody listens. Who's going to listen to me? Nobody. Nobody. Behold, their ears are uncircumcised, which means covered over so they cannot hear. We talk about uncircumcised hearts, uncircumcised lips, uncircumcised ears. Their inner attitude was against the Word of God. Now, notice the last part of verse 10. It says, they have no delight in it. Psalms 19 has told me that we've been awful wrong about looking at the Old Testament and saying it was a burden for the Jews to carry. The Old Testament was not a burden for the Jews to carry. It was sweetness to their mouth. It was joy. It was light. It was the revelation of God. It was the supreme blessing of God. It was only the oral tradition that grew up around it that made it a burden. But Psalms 19 says the Jews love the Word of God. And here is a diametrical position they have no delight in it. They will not subject themselves to it. They don't appreciate it. They've gone that far. Verse 11. But I am full of wrath of the Lord. I am weary with holding it in. Jeremiah has so identified himself with this message that it's consuming him if he doesn't speak. He's the guy that said, it's like a fire in my bones. I must speak. And so the message has a very hard message. 
had just taken the prophet over completely. Notice where it says, Pour it out on the children in the street, on the gathering of young men together. Both husband and wife shall be taken, the aged, the very old. What that's saying is, the judgment will fall from the children to the old people. Everybody will pay the price. Now, the word pour it out, this is the Old Testament metaphor of God's wrath pictured in the form of a cup of wine. Now, one of the best places that I get it from when I preach on, on uh, Mark 14 about when Jesus says, let this cup pass from me, and the question I ask New Testament is, what cup is Jesus talking about? In the Old Testament, the idea of cup can mean man's destiny. But it often speaks about the wrath of God. And so the text that's most meaningful to me in what Jesus was talking about and what I think it's talking about here is Psalm 75, 8. There is a cup in the hand of the Lord. The wine foams. Surely it is well mixed and all the wicked of the earth must drink it down to the dredges. But of course the New Testament picture is that it's not wicked man that drank the cup to the dredges. It was the Son of God that drank the cup for wicked man. Okay, uh, notice in verse 12, your houses will be turned over to others, your fields and their wives together. Uh, now, notice what's happening. That's exactly what God did to the Canaanite population when he brought the children of Israel into the land. He said, you're going to eat in fields that you didn't grow, and you're going to eat a vineyard you didn't plant, and you're going to live in houses that you didn't build. But notice, God is no respecter of persons. You violate his will, he takes you out of the blessings. As he took the Amorites out of the land because of their lifestyle, so he takes the, his own people out of the land because of their lifestyle. They were judged as severely as were the Canaanites. Now, notice, um, from the least of them to the greatest of them, everyone is greedy for gain. From the prophet even to the priest, everyone deals falsely. That is a picture of total corruption in society. Even the priests were doing their own thing, and they were doing it for money. Prophets, for money. Everybody living for number one, what's best for me, what makes me the most, what gives me the most pleasure, what's best for me and my family. Look at verse 14. Here's that, here's that verse I was looking for about another idea of being wounded or hurt. Uh, when it says, And they have healed the wound of my people slightly, saying, Peace, peace, but there is no peace. Now think with me. Let's just get your mind back, first of all, uh, into an Old Testament pattern if we can. The word peace is the Hebrew word what? Shalom. Now for us, peace in English means the absence of turmoil, tranquility, the absence of problems. But in Hebrew, the word shalom is a hello and a farewell. It is a word that has the twin connotations of the absence of problems and the presence of blessings and good. It is a word that speaks of health and prosperity. Notice what the prophets are saying. They're not saying no war, no war. They're saying everything's fine. God's not upset. Everything's all right. God's blessing is on Israel. Uh, the temple is full. The sacrifices are being offered. Everything's peachy cream. And so what Jeremiah says is, there is a deep cut and the skin has healed over, but underneath hasn't healed and blood poisoning and gangrene will come. Why do doctors not let the outer skin heal until the inner skin heals? Because of the drainage problem. That's why it's very important that, say, in something like knee surgery, even though the skin meets back together, you still can't put the pressure on that until the inside heals. Well, what the prophets have done is said, peachy cream, peachy cream, everything's fine, and the whole inside is full of corruption and gangrene and rottenness, and the patient will die. So that's the, that's the implication here. Um, let me, let's see. Okay. Notice verse 15, which, I, and I won't say this before I read verse 15. Well, let me just ask you a question. <laughs> I am thinking of a New Testament truth. A New Testament truth that we've talked about before. 
that I think is perfectly shown in verse 15, though not mentioned. Now, I want to read verse 15, and I want you to see if you can tell me what New Testament doctrinal truth is caught up right here. Were they ashamed because of the abominations they have done? They were not even ashamed at all. They did not even know how to blush. Therefore, they shall fall among those who fall. At a time that I will punish them, they shall be cast down, says the Lord. What, what New Testament doctrine could I pick up on of people in the presence of great light that did not even recognize the light? People in the midst of great sin, but were calling the sin what? Goodness and wholeness. What's, what am I talking about, New Testament speaking? The unpardonable sin. Calling the work of the Holy Spirit the evil one. In the presence of great light and great revelation, calling goodness, badness, and badness, goodness. Now, that's what I think the unpardonable sin is. It is a degradation of lifestyle to the point of not being able to respond to truth. The truth was being presented and they weren't even blushing in the midst of their sin because they had called their sin goodness. Does that fit? Verse 16, new paragraph. Thus says the Lord, stand by the ways. Now here he's saying, go out, I'll put it New Testament, go out in the highways and hedges and compel them to listen. Wherever people meet publicly, you go and talk to them. If it's a wedding, if it's a feast, at the men in the gate, at the children playing, you go talk to them. Stand by the way. See and ask for the ancient paths. Now, does yours have ancient paths? Which one? Godly paths. Okay, it's the word olam, which means can mean forever, ancient, old. What is he speaking about? The Mosaic legislation. The revelation at Sinai. You see, what all of us tend to do culturally is we get into a religious rut. And as long as we do what our immediate forebearers did, no matter what it is, we feel content. Christianity is not analyzing the last 50 years and her trends. Christianity is saying, if it's new, it's not for you. What we want to do is get back as close as we can to the revelation once and for all delivered to the saints. So, the same thing was here. Jeremiah was saying, I know your sacrifices are, multi uh, are, are many. I know your temple is full. I know you're going through all kinds of religious things, but you've left the essence of it for the ritual of it. And boy, don't we do that. They didn't need more revelation they needed to conform to the revelation they already had. They didn't need more insight and guidance for God. They needed to obey what they already knew. That was the problem. The story of the two women in church. I think I've told you before. One of them was a praise the Lord lady. Every time the preacher would, she'd praise the Lord, hallelujah, amen, preach on. And her friends sat next to her. And finally, she just couldn't stand it no more. She, to the preacher said, she's always saying amen, hallelujah, praise the Lord, and I can't hear anything you say. He said, that's all right, sister. What you do here, you don't do. Isn't that us? Always wanting more and more and not acting on what we already know. That was Israel. Now, the ancient ways, I think, is a way of beginning to talk about Something that's very important and very known to you. Look at the next phrase. There is where, where the good way is, walk in it, and you shall find rest to your souls. When Jesus in John 14, 6 says, I am the way, the truth, and the life, he was picking up on this Old Testament idea of the ancient way. In Acts chapter 9, verse 2, where the Christianity's first name was not Christianity, they were called the way. This is the Old Testament basis for that. 
Now, when it says, walk in it, it's not speaking about ritual actions once or twice or three or six or seven times a year. It's not talking about sacrifices when things get bad or good. It's talking about lifestyle commitment to the way. And when it says, you shall find rest to your souls, this is exactly what Jesus Christ picked up on. Matthew eleven twenty eight and 29, when he says, come unto me, I'll give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. Lean on me. Okay. Um, by the way, notice that the idea here is there are some guidelines in the ancient revelation. It's not that there's completely freedom. Just when Jesus said, take my yoke upon you, he, he wasn't saying there ain't no rules about this thing. There's no, it's not a lack of guidelines, but my guidelines fit well. They don't, they don't rub you or chafe you. So God has some guidelines for his people. There is an ancient way. We need to walk in it. It's not obliterating the way. It's obliterating the cultural way. And we get so, so used to and feel so self-righteous in I have set you a watchman. You might want to see Ezekiel chapter 3, verse 16 and following. It's talking about the prophets here. Then in verse 18, we have a parallel, a synonymous relationship. It's Hebrew poetry, but it's always Hebrew poetry is in thought process, it's not in rhyme. When it says, Hear, O nations, and know, O... Now, you have congregation. It's the Hebrew word kahal. It is usually refers to the people of God, the nation of Israel. This is where I think the word ecclesia, or church, came for in the New Testament. In the Septuagint, when they wanted to talk about the kahal, they called it the ecclesia of God. And so it became, that word became mean church. But it can mean assembly or gathering. And because O nation and O congregation is synonymous, I think, I would read translated assembly or gathering. We're not talking about God's people. We're talking about foreign nations, Okay. Hear, O nations, and know, O assemblies, what is among you. Hear, O earth, and behold, I bring disaster on this people. You might want to see chapter 4, verse 2, where what God does with Israel is a way of dealing with the whole world about who God is. And then notice in, uh, where it says, The fruit of their plans, because they have not listened to my word, and as for my law, they have rejected it. I've just written my Bible... They've sown what they wanted to sow. They're reaping the whirlwind from what they planted. Be not deceived. God is not mocked. Whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he reap. That's pretty much the way God's built his world. Now in verse 20, For what purpose does frankincense come to me from Sheba? And sweet cane from a distant land. Your burnt offerings are not acceptable and your sacrifices are not pleasing to me. My personal belief is that religion was a going thing in Jeremiah's day. I know it wasn't Josiah's day. I think the churches, I'm speaking metaphorically now, the churches were packed, the seminaries were full, uh, there was lots of religious words on the streets, Bibles were selling better than they've ever sold before. They had the form of godliness, but they denied the power thereof. They were outwardly religious, but there was no heart motivation and relationship with God. Now, when it says frankincense, you might want to see Exodus chapter 30, verse 34, where this is part of the temple incense that was burned every day as a sweet savor to God. Sheba is modern Yemen, Yemen in the southern part of the Sinai Peninsula. Sweet cane came from India. It's mentioned in Exodus 30, 23 and 24. It was a crucial ingredient for the anointing oil of the priest, the temple. And then we have burnt offerings, which is the word holocaust. It means something completely burnt, symbolizing total dedication. And then we have the word sacrifices, which is the peace offering found in Leviticus 7, 15 through 18, and Leviticus 19, 5 through 8 where certain parts of the animal were offered on the altar to God, and the offerer got to take the rest of the meat and have a big dinner with his friends, symbolizing the communal meal between God and the worshiper. In my opinion, the Lord's Supper is based on this peace offering in the Old Testament, where God symbolically comes and eats and fellowships with the person who brings it.
Now, all of these things were good and fine and wonderful if a heart attitude was in them. This is not a condemnation of the sacrificial system. This is a condemnation of perfunctory religiosity and ritual for the sake of ritual. You know, you can do all kinds of religious things, but if your heart is not right, it means nothing. Matter of fact, it really is a barrier because we think how wonderful we are because we're so religious. If our heart is not right, religion becomes a barrier to knowing God. That's exactly what had happened here. The channel had become the roadblock. So the channel must be rejected to get the, to get the path back open. Um, Therefore says the Lord, Behold, I am laying stumbling blocks before this people, and they will stumble against them. God's acting. By the way, before I forget this, let me give you some other verses where sacrifice is, uh, the attitude behind it is condemned. I don't think the sacrificial system is condemned, but the attitude is. Isaiah 1, 11 through 14. Amos 5, 21, Micah 6, 6 through 8. Okay, you can read down through verse 22 through 26. Um, it's a little thing talking about this northern enemy coming. I want to pick up on one word in verse 23, the word spear. They seize the bow and spear. In Goliath, he had one of these between his shoulder blades, and it's usually translated javelin. But in the Dead Sea Scrolls, especially the book called The Order of War, we think it's a little sharp, broad sword. Okay, it seems to fit better. We have the idea of the psychological uh, tension that mounted. The cruelty of this enemy is emphasized. The idea of a woman in childbirth being uh, seizing them. And then Judah called the daughter of Zion is all a play on the same metaphor. Here's an innocent young girl, the apple of God's eye. She's turned into a prostitute. She's going to be raped and devastated. And God's the one that's doing it because of the way she's living. That's, that's the, the metaphor that's been pulled all the way through here. Look at verse 26. Mourn is for a son. That's the ultimate sorrow for a Jew, is to lose your only son. Man, that's just devastating because the, of their view of the afterlife, their view of inheritance, the importance they placed on male children. Just devastating. The worst thing can happen, lose a son before he's of age. And that's the kind of sorrow will happen when Israel finally... The army's here. Repentance won't stop it. It's too late. It's coming. Then verse 27 and following is, I have made you... Now, King James has a word tower, does it not? The consonants for tower and the consonants for assayer, a, a, a person who tests a metal, are the same. Contextually, which fits best? Assayer. The whole view is a testing of metals. So mine has, I made you an essayer and a tester among my people, you, that you may know and essay their way, all of them. Now, does yours have stubbornly rebellious? We talk about the king of kings and the lord of lords as being Old Testament superlatives. This is rebel of rebels, is the literal. Rebel of rebels. They're ultimate rebel, rebels. They're the supreme rebels. In the face of such great light, such great love, such great miracles, such great provision. They have spurned me. They've spit on me. And I've had all I'm going to take, God says. Um, let's see. All of them are corrupt. There's not one righteous that God could spare the city for. Not one. Finally, he says in verse 30, They call them rejected silver because the Lord has rejected them. They, he tried in the crucible of experience to get them to turn to him. He tried in limited judgment. He tried in temporal judgment. But instead of the heat of the furnace melting the dross off, the heat of the furnace fused the dross to the metal. So all we have is slag that's good for nothing but to be thrown away completely. Nothing is savageable in slag. It, intermer it intermingles so badly that what was there of value, say lead, that you add to make kind of a catalyst, that's gone too. Everything is so mingled that nothing is good. So it's, it's, it's the doom of the nation of Israel.